Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So we just got through 13F season, like the most wonderful four times of the year. And so in this video, I want to share, you know, what am I seeing in terms of what super investors are buying? That's kind of getting me excited to dig a little bit deeper. So I'm just going to share what my process was to kind of get to 10 or 15 companies that I want to spend some time on. The first thing I did is I have a list of about 50 investors that I like to kind of comb through what they're buying and selling each quarter. Um, so I had to apply some filters, right? You got to get down to a manageable number of companies to look at. So the first filter for me was, is the company profitable? Okay. If it had a negative EV to EBIT ratio, it's out. I also filtered out some based on if the EV to EBITDA is, is really high and the company is going to require 25, 30% growth each year over the next decade or so to grow into that multiple. I'm not interested. That, that's too hard, right? That goes in the too hard pile for me. So that was my first filter. And I came up with these companies, okay, this is the first kind of iteration spreadsheet that I came up with. There are 35 companies in this list, okay? Got the ticker, company name, what industry it's in, market cap, EV to EBIT, and which investor or investors either bought this position new or added to it significantly in the fourth quarter of 2022. So again, this was just the first iteration. The next filter I applied is um, some of these industries uh, I, I like to stay away from, okay? That includes industries like healthcare providers and services, um, oil, gas, and consumable fuels, metals, and mining. Some of the industries, you know, I don't have any particular ability to wrap my head around those types of companies. And, you know, they tend to be very cyclical with oil and gas, mining, uh, healthcare providers. You know, Monish Babrai would say about healthcare companies, they, they, there's, there's forces on them, external forces where, you know, can really distort outcomes. So, um, it's not kind of pure market forces that are at play there. Um, so I like to avoid those as well. So anyway, after filtering these 35 companies down, I'll show you what I came up with. Uh, 14 companies, okay? Uh, again, that was by filtering out industries that, you know, I, I don't really want to touch and... I also factored in debt, right? If, if the ratio of net debt to last 12 months of operating income was just too high, uh, just don't, I don't feel comfortable taking on that much leverage uh, in a business. I, I filtered those out in that way as well. So let's kind of zoom in on these 14 companies. International Money Express, okay, in the IT services industry. And I'll, I'll just say a little bit about these columns. So this is Value Investors Club, okay? This is one of my go-to resources. If a company crosses my radar and I, I wanna kind of look at, okay, what has another smart investor, what work have they done on this, okay? Uh, Value Investors Club is a place where Investors who are admitted into the club submit write-ups and, you know, you get to kind of crawl into the mind uh, of a pretty good investor and, and see what they're seeing in a particular business, what their thesis is for that investment. So you can see here, this is when the latest Value Investors Club write-up was done for each of these companies. Uh, Open Insider. Uh, that, that's a website many of you are probably familiar with. 
It's a website I use to get a quick take on have, you know, has the CEO, has the CFO, has the chairman of the board or the president, have they been buying or selling shares recently? So it's kind of insider buying or selling. And you can see most of these, really there were only two uh, where there was insider buying. I think these were both by the CEO or CFO in the last year. Okay, so that's, you know, that's a signal I look for. Um, you know, some would say there's, there's really only one reason someone buys a stock, right? They think it's going to go up there bullish on the prospects of that business as an investment. Uh, there's plenty of reasons uh, someone would sell a company. So if you see an insider buying, a prominent insider, uh, that can be a pretty strong signal uh, to take a, a closer look. Insider ownership. So in this case, I went to sec.gov. I put all these tickers in um, and I wanted to know if you add up all of the insiders, what percentage of the outstanding shares do they own? Okay. Um, another signal I look for, 15%. That's that's pretty solid. I, I like to see above 10%. But if it's a bigger company uh, and it's only a couple percent, probably a better metric on that is, you know, how much, val what is the value of stock owned by the CEO, CFO, um, high level insiders versus their net worth? Okay, so that's probably a better measure when you get into the larger companies. Uh, but if you're in kind of mid, small cap, I definitely like to see higher insider ownership figures above 10%. And unfortunately, uh, of all of the small caps and, and mid caps, there's really only one that checks that box. And that's this first one, International Money Express. Uh, the next column is buybacks. Okay, over the last five years, have any of these companies bought back a significant number of their shares? And buybacks can be a great way for a company, a tax efficient way to provide value to shareholders, provided uh, the share price is trading below what the company is actually worth, right below the intrinsic value. Uh, so that's something you need to consider as well, if a company is throwing a bunch of money at buybacks and, you know, it's it's a pretty lofty price as compared to what it's worth, that can actually destroy shareholder value. Um, so a couple of these are, are pretty strong in the share buyback category. You've got Group One Automotive and Louisiana Pacific. OK, so that was um fun to kind of see, you know, are there any buyback kings in the mix here? Market cap. Uh, so I did a study, I think it was a couple weeks ago, pretty short study on U.S. companies and uh, which U.S. companies had returned at least 10x over the last decade. And particularly what I was looking for is what was the starting size of those companies, those 10 baggers in the U.S.? And there was only one that was large cap, okay? Uh, everything else was below 10 billion in market cap. And it turned out, if you look at the buckets of mid cap, small cap, micro cap, uh, it was kind of equal proportion. In other words, if you put all of the companies on a dartboard that were mid cap, all the companies on a dartboard that were small cap, and you threw a dart, you had about an equal chance of hitting a 10 bagger in any of those kind of market cap buckets, mid cap or less. So uh, I really like to focus below 10 billion uh, in my own kind of stock hunt, my stock hunting, that's where I like to fish. Um, so, you know, a lot of these are below 10 billion. Some are a little bit more than 10 billion, uh, but I definitely screened out the mega caps 
that were being bought by these super investors. So it goes up to around 50 billion in market cap uh, for the companies that made the final list. Uh, EV to EBIT, um, that's kind of like, you know, enterprise value is, is what is it going to take to buy this whole business, right? If I just want to write a check and buy the whole business, enterprise value includes the equity, right? Uh, it includes the debt and it factors in kind of the cash as well. Uh, and then of course, EBIT, operating earnings, um, earnings before interest and taxes. So really, I love seeing numbers below 15 in this column. Um, and they're basically all they're basically all below 15 except Copart, uh, which is part of why I didn't highlight Copart. It was a little on the expensive end. Seems like a great business. Um, it's done incredibly well over the last couple decades. I think maybe 20% plus um, returns to owners uh, in terms of share price appreciation. So you could definitely, you know, think of it as, as one of these long-term compounders. Uh, but 23 on an EV to EBIT basis, it's, it's maybe about fairly priced maybe a little less than fairly priced, but it, it was a little too high for me. And combined with it being a, a pretty sizable market cap, uh, that enabled me to um, kind of shelf this one. Uh, and then the last column, who bought it, right? Who either bought it as a new position or added significantly to it uh, as one of the more concentrated positions in the portfolio. You've got Connor Haley from Alta Fox, David Abrams, Jeff Ubin, Greg Alexander, Warren Buffett, Brian Lawrence of Oak Cliff, Francois Ro Rochon, uh, I think that's Giverny Capital, uh, David Abrams, Pabrai, Chuck Acre, Josh Tarasov. Of course, Chuck isn't really actively managing the portfolio anymore at Acre Capital. Um, but, you know, I really respect the culture there. If you look at Acre Capital, it's really a museum of these long-term compounders. Uh, and I, I really appreciate that approach to investing. Andrew Rosenblum uh, from Bonsai Partners. John Huber, who isn't, I think he might be the, he's one of the few on the list that's not yet tracked by Data Roma. Uh, but I've really enjoyed some of John Huber's um, writings that, that he shares on his website, which is Sabre Capital Management. Um, so, yeah, so I think we've, we've mentioned all of these. There's definitely some duplicates in here in terms of, you know, which investors are coming up with these ideas. So, um, yeah, how did I select these? Or, or highlight them green. Uh, really, it was, you know, insider ownership in this case was a big one. How small it was, was, was appealing to me. Um, yeah, the VIC write-up. You know, it expects that this thing is, is worth about twice as much as it's currently trading for in the markets. Kind of a two-bagger over the next three years or so, right? A double. Two baggers, kind of weird. A double over the next three years. Um, bear in mind, that's just kind of the base case. There's also a bull case and a bear case. Check out the write-up if you guys are interested in, you know, peeling back some layers on these. Pathword Financial, I, I, I really tend to avoid banks. Um, you know, there's, there's, there tends to be a lot of leverage built into banks. And I just find them really difficult to, to dig into and, and understand at a deep level. Um, I find there's, there's just a lot of mystery uh, with banks and, and their loans and you know, trying to evaluate how risky those loans are. It, it tends to just be in the too hard basket for me. And 
you know, pairing that with, with the low insider ownership and, and no recent insider buying, uh, I just took a pass on that one. Vistry Group. Now, this one's very interesting to me. Uh, Vistry Group acquired Countryside Partnerships, okay? Countryside Partnerships is something that both Jeff Ubin bought into, Norbert Liu, one of my all-time favorite investors of Punch Card Capital. Uh, there were a number of investors I really respected in Countryside Partnerships, and Vistry acquired Countryside. And, you know, Jeff Ubin is, is staying the course. You know, he's, he's kind of staying along even after that acquisition took place. Um, very low insider ownership. Again, that, that gives me pause. They're also based in the UK, which, you know, I'm not necessarily opposed to owning a business in the UK. Um, I definitely prefer to own companies in the US. I, I just think, you know, once I leave the US, which is where I live, uh, it just adds layers um, in terms of not knowing what I don't know, okay? So the, a few reasons, Vistry is kind of a pass at the moment. Now, if I see Norbert Liu uh, take that kind of transition over from Countryside to Vistry, uh, that, that may prompt me to go deeper on Vistry. So I'll, I'll keep an eye out for that. Group One Automotive um, by Greg Alexander, who runs Conifer Management. Uh, you know, auto retailer, it's, it's hard for me to get excited about that, uh, especially because it seems like we're really coming down from this kind of crazy used car boom. Um, I don't even know if they deal with used cars, but especially at this, at where we are now um, in terms of car sales and where I feel like we're at in that kind of market cycle. Uh, I just, I can't get excited about an auto retailer. And again, fairly low insider ownership um, buybacks, decent, pretty solid. 31% of shares retired over the last five years. So pretty strong tailwind there with buybacks. Uh, if it remains cheap, you can see enterprise value to EBIT of six, uh, quite low. Uh, I, I don't know how that tends to be right now in terms of other auto retailers. So that would, that would be something to understand um, if I were wanting to dig into this more, but I'm just not. So uh, this was particularly interested, interesting. I really wanted to have reasons to dig into this. Uh, Potlatch Deltic, uh, I believe they own like a sustainable timber uh, properties, okay? So it's a REIT, a real estate investment trust that owns timberland, okay, sustainable uh, forest timberland. So, uh, and this is owned by Inclusive Capital, which is not Jeff Ubin's original fund, which is Value Act. It's his kind of newer um, sustainability-oriented fund. So I really wanted to see reasons uh, to go into this one you know, there's no VIC write-up. There's nothing happening in terms of insider buying. Very low insider ownership. No buybacks. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't find anything. I'm going to show you guys a little trick that I really like. Uh, there's a few different websites that kind of compile quarterly letters from different uh, investment funds. And one thing I really love that, that these websites do is they point out which companies are discussed in each of these letters. Okay, so this is uh, a Reddit forum, it's the security analysis uh, Reddit forum. And within that, there's this Q4, go away. Why is that, why is that popping up? 
Don't do that. My computer's a little slow right now. It's, it's a little discouraging. Uh, Q4 2022 letters and reports. So the trick is, if you go in here, of course, this is right behind my, and you do Control F, okay, Command F on a Mac, uh, PCH. So you can search for a particular ticker in here. It's not showing any because there is no PCH. Um, but if you do something like Brookfield Asset Management, it shows you which fund has talked about Brookfield Asset Management in Q4. Okay, so you can go up, you can open that letter and dig into that. There's also a blogger on Blogspot who does the same thing basically, but it's a little different in terms of results. So what I did uh, from this final list, I went and I command F, found all of the letters that mentioned these companies in um, the Reddit and in the blog spot, uh, Q4. So I've included links down here uh, for the companies that turned up, right? So you can look Louisiana Pacific, Gildan, Activewear, a bunch on Ferguson, a bunch on Brookfield. So these are fantastic. Uh, it's just great to be able to, you know, you're thinking about okay, should I go deeper on a company? What do these different fund managers say about why they bought or why they trimmed or whatever they're saying about these companies? You can uh, dig into that for free, which is fantastic. Okay. Uh, the next one, Louisiana Pacific. Okay, this is owned by Berkshire. Now, because it's a $5 billion market cap, it certainly wasn't bought by Warren Buffett, okay? I put Buffett just because he's the uh, head henchman there at Berkshire Hathaway. But this was a Ted or a Todd buy, okay? Um, it's super cheap. Look at this. And not cheap. I'm not saying cheap like everybody should go out and buy it because it's ridiculously underpriced. I'm just saying compared to everything else on here, um, on an EV to EBIT basis, Three is very low. Um, paper and forest products, I, I believe they, they manufacture and sell paper. You can see the last VIC write-up is a bit old. Um, what is that? Two and, a, two and a quarter, two years and a quarter ago, something like that. Uh, there has been recent insider buying. Um, for Louisiana Pacific. I think the CEO and the CFO have been buying. So that's interesting. Buybacks, 51% of outstanding shares have been retired over the last five years. That is massive, okay? So clearly uh, the company has kind of excess cash, right? They think they're cheap, cheaper than they should be. Uh, cheaper than what the company is actually worth. Uh, so they are aggressively buying back shares. And presumably, Ted or Todd like that, right? That that's, uh, they think it's cheap as well. And so they're, they're getting on board. Um, I'm sure partly because of that. So this is something I want to understand better. Uh, why is it trading so low? at a three, three X EV to EBIT multiple. Uh, Gildan Activewear, this is a Canadian company. You can see a fairly recent write-up in the clothing business. Um, again, basically negligible insider ownership for Gildan. You know, not terrible buybacks over the last five years. Uh, not gonna move the needle too much at 18% uh, of shares retired. Uh, I do respect Brian Lawrence quite a bit at Oak Cliff Capital. He tends to be very concentrated, usually only has like five or six positions in the portfolio. Um, so 
But, you know, no, nothing here got me too excited to dig deeper on Gildan Active War. I think the upside uh, in this write-up from Value Investors Club was about like 20%, okay? The shares have appreciated a bit since this write-up was done. So, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of meat left on the bone. Um, that doesn't mean the investment picture hasn't improved over the last nine months or so. Uh, we can't really go on what this investor was saying nine months ago. We can't go on what any investor is saying ever, right? Uh, this is, these are really just opinions. Um, but, you know, if I'm going to spend some time on something, I like to see at least there's some smart investor out there uh, who's bullish based on current prices. And presumably there is, right? Brian Lawrence is because he bought in Q4. Um, but, you know, I'm not so excited about a, a, a clothing company out of Canada uh, that has virtually no insider ownership to speak of. Fortune Brands Innovations, okay? Building products, they make uh, a number of different product lines that go into new construction. Um, again, I don't think the upside was much based on current price, negligible insider ownership, some share buybacks, but not enough to, to get me too jazzed up about it. Uh, Francois Rochon, I think is how you pronounce that, of Giverny Capital, I believe uh, that's his fund. U-Haul. Okay, so U-Haul, I have a lot of experience with, it turns out. I used to manage a moving company in Madison, Wisconsin. And we had, you know, when I started there, we had like three trucks, okay? And during the summers, three trucks w wasn't even going to come close to being enough. So if we needed more trucks than we had for, you know, say we had five, six, seven moves on a certain day, we would go to U-Haul and we would rent trucks. Now, I really didn't like dealing with U-Haul. Okay, that's, that's one thing that gives me pause here. I don't know if any of you have been to U-Haul. You go in, the customer service is usually terrible. Often what happens is I'm, I'm waiting in line for about 20 minutes, okay? There is one person at the cash register who's helping a customer and they're not in a hurry. They don't really care, okay? It's the same feeling I get when I go into the DMV, okay? They don't care. It's almost like they wanna take as long as possible uh, and help as few people as possible in, in a given hour or whatever it is. I'm not sure why, it just drives me crazy. And I get that feeling when I go to U-Haul. Now I've had some incredible experiences with, with different people at, at U-Hauls, but that is the exception. So, you know, that gives me a big pause on U-Haul because you, cer you certainly don't have delighted customers with U-Haul. If you go to U-Haul, it's because you want the cheapest price or there's just no, no other place that you can rent a truck from. Okay? They, they really have uh, not a monopoly, but they're the cheapest. Okay, when I moved here to Asheville from the Bay Area, uh, I looked into pods. I was like, oh man, that's expensive. It was gonna be like $8,000 to send a pod out here with our stuff. So I ended up getting a U-Box, which is kind of a smaller version of a pod, but it was so much cheaper, okay? So, you know, I'm sure they have a moat in the sense that they're the, they could be the low cost provider, um, but the customer service just drives me nuts. Uh, there has been insider buying over the last year, pretty significant, I believe, insider buying in terms of how much money these insiders are, are spending. Uh, very large insider ownership, okay, 43% of the outstanding shares in insider hands. Um, so, you know, I'm a real mixed bag 
on U-Haul. Do I want to go deeper? Do I not? Uh, I'm not sure yet. Uh, the jury is still out on that one. Um, but I definitely love the insider buying and the large insider ownership. Uh, the next one, Brookfield Asset Management. So, of course, Monish Pabrai has been buying Brookfield Asset Management. Chuck Acre has owned it, I think, for, for some time, along with KKR. And Josh Tarasoff of Greenlee Lane Capital Management also um, was buying Brookfield Asset Management in the fourth quarter. So uh, Brookfield is interesting. Monish Babrai has talked quite a bit about Bruce Flat. Uh, it seems like Brookfield has been incredible for, for shareholders. I think the CAGR, uh, in terms of shareholder returns over the last 30 years, has been like 20% a year, okay? Uh, as opposed to 10% for the U.S. stock market. So just incredible performance. And I was watching Howard Marks. Uh, my last video is on Howard Marks. Um, and I believe, I'm pretty sure Brookfield acquired Oak Tree, at least some, some aspect of Oak Tree, uh, for exposure to the distressed debt, right? They wanted to kind of ramp up their exposure to, um, you know, high yield bonds and distressed debt. And uh, so that's, that's pretty interesting. Howard Marks is somebody I have a ton of respect for. So the fact that, that he's kind of operating under the Brookfield um, umbrella now is, is pretty compelling. I'm also drawn to the renewables um, segment of of Brookfield's portfolio. So, you know, it, it, it's a, and oh, so the thing I wanted to say, Howard Marks was talking about how, uh, I think when he was starting Oak Tree, uh, there was a big crash in the market, okay? So, and, and it had been going on for a while. I think this was in the early 2000s after the dot-com boom. You've, you had three years in a row of the S&P losing money, okay? Three years in the red uh, in the S&P. And so investors were giving up on the stock market. And they were looking for alternative investments that weren't stocks, that weren't bonds, um, to get a yield on their capital, but to not be in stocks or bonds. And that was a huge tailwind for Oak Tree. And I get a little bit of a sense, maybe those tailwinds uh, are gonna resurface um, in, in the current environment. Now, again, I'm, I would never make an investment based on forecasting, based on what I think is going to happen, uh, but it's something I'm kind of paying attention to. Uh, where is the flow of money? Uh, in terms of stock market, bond market, or some of these alternative asset managers like Brookfield or KKR. So um, that, that's on my radar for a number of reasons. Uh, Ferguson PLC, this is a, a recent buy from Andrew Rosenblum. In fact, I think his letter just came out. Um, and it seems like every quarter he's, he's buying something new. And in Q4, it was Ferguson. Uh, so Ferguson, their kind of motto is, if water flows through it, Ferguson wants to distribute it. Okay. So they distribute, you know, I think like washing machines and, you know, anything that water flows through kind of to, to builders. Uh, essentially. Builders and uh, homeowners is, is who they work with, those, those markets. Uh, but again, a company in the UK. Uh, you can see a fairly recent write-up. Um, there's no real price target in this write-up. It's just kind of, hey, here's what the street thinks this is going to grow at. We think it's going to be significantly higher than that. Uh, insider ownership, again, definitely gives me pause. 
Um, I will say, I looked it up, the, the CEO of Ferguson has about $11 million, 11 million US dollars uh, worth of stock. So even though it's very small on a percentage basis, I mean, you know, it's a decent sized company, 27 billion market cap, you know, there, there's reasonable skin in the game for the CEO, 11 million uh, versus I believe what he's compensated each year in terms of salary. So, you know, when you get companies in the bigger market caps, these insider ownership percentages can be a little bit misleading. So keep that in mind. Um, but, you know, it wasn't something that's, it's not something that's really calling to me. Copart. Um, this is something I believe Chris Meyer, I'm pretty sure Chris Meyer of 100 Baggers, the guy who wrote 100 Baggers, owns Copart. He, he seems to regard it very highly. Uh, John Huber, again, a guy not many people know about. Uh, he's not yet tracked by Dataroma or some of these uh, services that allow you to track super investors. And I think it was just a couple quarters ago, he crossed over that $100 million threshold AUM where you have to file these 13 Fs. Uh, but that's the kind of guy I like to follow, right? Somebody who's kind of just having to start filing 13 Fs, right? Because the, the fund AUM is still pretty low. Similar situation to Connor Haley at Alta Fox, I think pretty recently, uh, he crossed over 100 million as well. Um, but again, the, the thing that gives me pause with Copart is really the size, um, 32, 33 billion market cap and this fairly high EV to EBIT. Um, so, you know, you're going to need pretty substantial growth in a company like Copart um, to do well as an investor given where it's trading. Uh, so I definitely would be interested in Copart if this were closer to 15 or 16. So, you know, if something happens in the markets and uh, there's more blood in the streets and Copart takes a dive from here, it is definitely something that I'm going to be digging deeper into. Uh, I think I've talked enough about KKR. Uh, this BN, Brookfield Corp., uh, Brookfield Asset Management and Brookfield Corp. were the same company. Uh, I think in sometime in the fourth quarter of last year, uh, they separated. One was spun off. So that's why these show up as separate entities. Um, yeah, not much more to say about that. So again, uh, two ways. If any of these pique your interest, two ways to dig deeper Go to Value Investors Club, look at the, the latest write-up or the latest couple of write-ups on these companies uh, and play around with these two websites. I'll link to these in the description of this video. Uh, the Reddit, the subreddit for um, tracking these investor letters and what they're discussing, right? What companies they're discussing. Fantastic tool, fantastic resource. And you can see I linked directly to those um, in the bottom of this spreadsheet. And I'll link to the spreadsheet as well, of course. Uh, I think that's it for this one, guys. It probably got a little bit long already, so I'll wrap it up. If there's any companies that you guys are digging into, preferably in the mid cap or smaller, uh, that you've seen from super invest super investor buys in Q4. Let me know in the comments. Uh, I'm sure there are companies that I missed. Um, and I want to have a look if, if there are. So let me know. Thanks for watching, guys. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.